All right, hello everyone and welcome. I've got just at two o'clock. So welcome everyone today uh, to today's webinar, Energy Savings and Runtime Extension Strategies for Recovery Boilers, presented today by Dr. Jamil. Uh, today's webinar will be presented in accordance with TAPI's antitrust policy. Uh, specifically, TAPI's aim is to promote research and education and to arrange for the collection, dissemination, and interchange of technical concepts and information and fields of interest to its members. Uh, TAPI is not intended to and may not play any role in the competitive decisions of its members or their employers in, or in any way restrict competition among companies. Uh, specifically, that just means no discussion of pricing or competitive decisions. Oh, sorry about that. Um, let's see if this helps with the audio at all. Thanks for letting me know. Uh, and okay sorry just one moment let's see if this helps a bit so um okay hopefully that helps with the audio um going forward uh you can see a couple of folks have already noticed. If you do have any questions or chat or problems, please feel free to put them in the chat box. For those unfamiliar, if you just hover your mouse below on the bottom, a ribbon will pop up. There is a Q&A feature um, with two little comment bubbles and a chat feature with a single bubble. Um, those comments will come straight to the panelists um, and Taffy staff. Um, also, this webinar is uh, sponsored today by Clyde Industries. So thank you very much to Clyde Industries um, for their sponsorship of today's webinar um, and production of the content. Uh, following this webinar, uh, the recording will be posted to tappy.org and slides will also be available after the event. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Jamil. Um, thank you much. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. And uh, thanks for joining, uh, joining me this afternoon in trying to make, have a small discussion about energy savings and runtime extension strategies for recovery boilers. So a little bit of background, uh, the craft process or the craft piping process is the most cost-effective method being used uh, to generate uh, uh, pulp for paper. It's a closed uh, cycle process and the recovery boiler is where the chemicals are recovered through a combustion and a reduction process. So having the recovery boiler staying online is paramount to the for this whole cycle to work. If uh, one wants to look at uh, a pulp production of around a thousand tons per day, the dry solids that are generated is about one and a half times that number, which has to be sent to the, uh, to the recovery boiler to be processed. So as a little example, if I take a 2000 ton uh, pulp production, I'll have about 3000 tons of uh, dry solids. If I assume about 800 tons uh, dollars per ton, you can see that uh, if the boiler goes down, you end up in excess of a million dollars loss per day. So this goes to set the stage as why it is so important to have this boiler running. So in order for the uh, boiler to run successfully, it amounts to controlling the fouling and what I mean by the controlling the fouling is managing the ash that is accumulating in the heat transfer sections of this boiler. There are two primary ways to do this, and one is through the operation, which affects the deposition, and the other is through soot blowing, which affects the removal. What I will be uh, addressing here is basically the soot blowing side and we will be talking about nozzle types, sizes, strategies, pressures, and fr frequencies of operation. 
so if we have a high fouling situation where a lot of ash is accumulating on the heat transfer section that are shown here on the this little uh, image on the left and which is a section from this bigger picture the amount of energy or heat that is going to be absorbed from the flue gas is depleted and as a result the temperatures rise in the back sections of the boiler this then eventually leads to the plugging as you see here typically in the generating bank areas where the tube spacings are lower and the boiler goes down so in order to manage all of this we have to look at this whole thing as a system and what i was just talking to you about is controlling the fouling another piece that we would talk about is how do we do this while uh, we are using the best or saving the most amount of energy that we can and then how do we keep all of this running to be economically sustainable which would be the third piece here uh, which i will touch upon and that's quite extensive it's a program that we are working on at uh, Clyde Industries, which uh, involves the fitness to operate. <laughs> so let's get to the first uh, strategy or first section, which is about the high performance nozzles. What you see here is an illustration of a soot blower nozzle. It has a converging section and a diverging section, also known as the de Laval nozzle. So high pressure steam to the left of this image is accelerated through this nozzle till it reaches what's known as the throat or the narrowest point, at which point the uh, steam reaches the speed of sound. And as it expands in this diverging section, it exceeds the speed of sound. So the pressure is then reduced further through the diverging section. Eventually, you end up with this jet, and this jet is then a supersonic jet, and what we are interested in is being able to reduce this pressure down to the atmospheric pressure at the exit of the nozzle. The performance of the jet is measured by what's known as the peak impact pressure, which is the centerline velocity of this jet. As you go further down, it will decay. So if you do not uh, expand this properly to reach the atmospheric condition or very close to it, you create shock waves down here. And you can see this on the right hand side. This is a conventional soot blower nozzle. Here's the jet in blue. And if you look at a similar situation in a lab, by passing light through the jet, you create this shock wave right here at the end of this orange arrow, which in a soot blower would be roughly here. So this shock wave then basically removes all the energy that is needed to clean these tubes, which is further downstream. A lot of this work uh, I had done back in the uh, middle 90s, while I was still in uh, at the University of uh, Toronto, and I identified this. And if you need uh, more information about this, I would recommend that you look at the TAPI uh, engineering proceedings of 93, and the TAPI journal of May 94 to get more information about this. So having identified the problem with these nozzles, then the next was to find a way to overcome it. So we needed a way to design a nozzle such that this high pressure inside this lance tube reaches the pressure of the atmosphere or very close to it by the time it exits the nozzle, which is at the end of the lance, at the end, outer diameter of the lance tube, and this has to be done in the shortest possible distance. So the best way you can do this is by creating a contoured expansion as opposed to a conical expansion. In, so this then has been used and identified prior to this in the aerospace industry. And you can see that this rocket engine here basically has that same contour that you see over here. And this would be the throat of this rocket engine. So when it comes to a soot blower nozzle design, this 
in fact involves rocket science. So here's uh, a test setup that I did at uh, Georgia Tech back in about uh, 2002, where I'm testing nozzles. And this is the lance tube up here. I'm using high pressure air that comes down this pipe. And then I'm going to be discharging it through these two nozzles. A closer look, you'll see the two nozzles here, one in blue and one identified as yellow. And these jets eventually are reaching these pitot tubes through which I'm trying to measure the peak impact pressure of the uh, jet and hence uh, evaluate the nozzle design. So when I do this, I can find that for a conventional nozzle, you would follow as you raise the pressure on this horizontal axis, you would follow this black line, which I call a V-type nozzle, and you would find that it starts to flatten out. The reason here being that shock wave that I spoke to you about. So if we can correct for that and fully expand the jet, we would end up following this reddish line which is the average of these two, the upstream nozzle and the downstream nozzle. So this has been measured at a distance of about 30 inches. So we are comparing two nozzles of the same size. And this is the peak impact pressure. So if you, for example, you're operating at 300 PSI, you could almost double it from what it was if you were to go with the standard nozzle. And back in the nine, middle 90s, early 2000s, we did a lot of projects where we could also save steam by taking a soup flow that is operating here and operating it back here. So here's your first steam savings, as well as your extension of runtime by doubling your, your energy available to clean. Now, while that uh, graph showed you the V nozzle versus a fully expanded nozzle, here I'm c comparing a fully expanded nozzle of one inch versus a one and a quarter. So these are now two size differences. On this axis here is distance from the nozzle, and on this axis is the impact pressure. I'm keeping the nozzle pressure in this example for at 200. You can see that the jet is able to reach further for cleaning and at any given location, it also delivers more energy for cleaning. So there's two, you get a higher reach and you also get everywhere a higher cleaning power. So when it comes to uh, your runnability and your cleaning on the soup blowing side, then you have the need to use fully expanded nozzles and one could strategically also use nozzles of different sizes to, to get to the uh, end goal. So from here, let's move on to the second strategy, which is got to do with what we call smart clean. Before I get into the details of this, let me share with you what really is the price of soup blowing steam. On the right hand side here is a graph that shows you the black liquor solids going from 50% to 100%. And these graphs show you the heating value of the liquor. And on this vertical axis is the production of steam from this boiler in terms of uh, kilograms here. So for, if we take a case of 72% dry solids and we get up to about 6,000 BTUs per pound heating value, we find that we can, we should be able to generate around 3.3 times uh, the, uh, the steam. So if we take this example here of 2860 tons liquor firing and at 3.3 tons, we would end up with roughly about one and a half million dollars per year cost the cost of steam if we were to consume 5% in the soup blower. If we were to go to 8% in the soup blower, 
you would naturally go to a higher number. So on average, we could say then between five and 8% for this case, there is about a $2 million cost per annum that is associated with just the steam. This does not include the maintenance portion of the soot blowing. So having said that, then let's look at the smart clean, which is really a soot blower controlling system, which is working on a feedback based on the boiler as to, and trying to optimize your soot blowing operation. So we are trying to keep the steam consumption to as low a number to make this an, uh, an efficient operation. We have implemented this system in about 50 boilers worldwide and it uses a dynamic control of the sequence, which normally is not dynamically controlled. You'd have a fixed sequence and it also dynamically adjusts the cleaning power. This is done by varying the flow of steam to the soot blower. So to lay this out here, you have your smart clean system, which is a control system with a soot blowing strategy that decides when, where, and how to clean or operate these soot blowers. It's important as to the when and where because timing is a big issue when it comes to soot blowing. You don't need to wait too long before you, can, before you lose control of your fouling uh, control. Another feature that we have in our smart clean system is the safety aspects, which for example, involves uh, alarming and alerting people if the soup blowers have not made them home, not come back or their operations are not looking right. Here's an example down here of this, of a boiler tube where a soup blower had got stuck and continuously blew on this boiler tube. This happens to be in a power boiler, but eventually it punched a hole right through, the, right through this tube. And having something like this happen on a recovery boiler would, have, would be uh, a disastrous situation if there was water in that tube. From a sustainability side, we are adding into the clean uh, control system condition based monitoring, which tries to monitor the health of the soot blower through instrumentation and measurements that are made at every individual soot blower. And this together with walk downs and inspections is all rolled into a program known as FTO, the fitness to operate, which is basically the other leg in that system that I spoke to you at the beginning. So how does all of this work? In a pictorial form, we have a supervisory system here. As an example, there is a PLC that controls the soot blower. And in this PLC is a model that, uh, that evaluates the cleanliness of the boiler or the various, uh, the, fouling section, the fouling in each section. That information is derived through boiler data that comes from the DCS over to this side. So the left side of this line is what we are doing and on the right side is what the mill is doing. So we have a PC that is associated with this PLC and then we can also add gauges to the uh, heat transfer sections, the pendants to weigh, to weigh the amount of ash and we can also use the boiler data to evaluate the heat transfer through this thermodynamic model. All this information is then passed back to the DCS and the DCS is then instructed to operate a specific soot blower and a set point is given to the uh, flow control valve to set the cleaning power. So through our experiences of doing this on over almost 50 boilers, what we have been able to do is classify various people of boil, uh, soot blowing systems from high wastage of steam where you have, where you're consuming 
more than about 10% of the boiler steam production to a really ideal target where you're at about two and a half percent of the boiler steam production. So the goal is to try and come from up here towards the two and a half percent. Most of the time you might end up somewhere in this area and some people who have everything dialed in properly could even get down into this range of two and a half percent of the boiler steam production. And when, in my earlier slides, I spoke to you about the price of steam and you can see that there is a significant savings if you can come down from this high number down to this, towards this direction while keeping the boiler running. So here's, uh, to illustrate this, here's an example of a mill that I was looking at in Canada. They were producing around 312 metric tons per hour of steam, and they were consuming around 23 tons per hour in soot blowing, or 50 kilopounds. So this amounts to between seven to 8% of the boiler steam production. So if we are able to drive this towards 4%, we should be able to save around 10 tons per hour or 22 kilopounds. It turns out that for this plant, the cost of steam was about $20 a ton, which would give you an annual savings of around a million point seven. This is another example of a mill overseas that I'm looking at, they have five boilers. And if we were to go through the same exercise between their steam production and their steam for soot blowing, which is 150 and 10 in kilograms a second, and at $11 a ton per, uh, for the uh, steam, you can see that these four boilers could range in the neighborhood of a million and a half to almost two and a half million which if one was to look at this for the whole mill would be a substantial amount of money saved through the year. They have four boilers in this plant. So how then does this system work? It monitors the fouling through the thermodynamic modeling or uses the strain gauges which weigh the ash on these various pendants and it monitors and instructs the soot blowers for this section. Through the system we also look at timers, certain soot blowers will have to run no matter how long there are fixed times and we also look at process data which has got to do like with boiler uh, draft losses and so on as well as we could set rules that certain soot blowers can run or certain soot blowers cannot run based on specific rules that have been set. So based, all of this information then is fed into the smart clean system, which drives the soot blowers and the steam flow to those soot blowers. So if we were to take a pendant here and look at the heat absorbed in the clean and dirty condition, we come up with a ratio of what we call the cleaning factor. And we then as we operate these, say these three soot blowers, one, two, and three, we can measure the impact on this cleaning factor. Uh, cleaning factor. And you can see, for example, when soot blow number one ran, you improved it by this amount, delta one. Soot blow number two ran, soot blow number three ran. And you can see from these three that the biggest change came when you ran super number three. So automatically, then the system would learn that the most effective soot blower in this stack is number three. And that one would run most frequently. And if you reach your targets, it may even avoid blowing number two and number one and move on to the next soot blower that needs to be run. So through this process, you could automatically save steam. So here then is a setup where we have this cleanliness factor through this thermodynamic model. We can also put gauges 
that on the hanging rods in the penthouse area that hold the superheaters and weigh the ash and make judgments over time. So in terms of this cleanliness factor, as we get dirty, you can see the, and or foul, you can see the cleanliness coming down and these red lines here indicate when soup blowers run. So when this cleanliness factor reached this dirty set point, we ran a soup blower and it restores it and it decays and it restores it this, and it, so on and so forth. And you can keep doing this and following each section minute by minute throughout the, uh, throughout the day. So if you were to compare these two systems of information or feedback, the gauges would help us to identify large weights in specific areas of the boiler. For example, this gauge shows you a very high rate or high number in comparison to the one on that side. Then you know that there's more ash here, but you might not be able to see it just through the heat transfer because you only have an in and out of the heat exchanger. Uh, the the uh, thermodynamic model cannot identify local uh, high accumulations of ash, but it can give you the overall picture. So together, these two then give you a good view of what's happening in your, the fouling history of your boiler. So when I take these two signals and put them together, you can see for this boiler, the blue line would be associated with the strain gauge and the pink line associated with the clean cleanliness factor on the right hand side. And these vertical lines, these yellow and blue lines here indicate the running of a soot blower. So the smart gauge is on the left and the thermodynamic model on the right. And you can see as the uh, soot blowers ran, we end up with uh, uh, we end up with uh, the cleanliness being restored or the weight being reduced, and these follow each other. They're almost like mirror images of each other. So, in order to uh, take all this information and process it, we also are able. We also provide a service where we can take all these signals back through your Pi, Pi system in your, in your mill and push it out to the cloud. And then we have a Pi historian on this side, which reaches out to the cloud, grabs all this information and passes it over to the applied engineers here in Atlanta. And then we can communicate with your mill engineer and your mill process engineer and be able to discuss this system and how the soot blowing is working and where the boiler is uh, in its uh, runtime history and if any corrections need to be made. Here's an e example from a, an operation where we uh, in, uh, implemented this system recently. There were three boilers in this, uh, in this mill in Brazil, A, B, and C. The goal here was to save steam. They wanted to save 35 tons an hour of steam between all three boilers. So it was broken into two phases. The first phase was to save 25 tons in boiler B. And the next, based on the success of that, they, were, they would award boilers A and uh, C to get the rest to make up this 35. And this is what was achieved at the end. So there was 25 here six at this and eight here to give you almost 40. As a result of this, the mill was able to shut down or decommission a small power boiler that was being run at this plant. So you can see how the steam savings coming from the soup blower can help you to uh, do something else. For example, you had fossil fuel boilers, you could shut those down or reduce the amount of fossil fuel being consumed uh, somewhere else. So to look at how this system can work together with uh, extending your runtime, we need to pay attention to plugging, which, is, which happens when you lose control of fouling. So the rate at which you are removing something 
is now less than the rate at which it is uh, ash is being deposited. So if you wanted to avoid plugging, then you need to at least be able to remove at a rate at which things are being deposited. So in order to do that, we've already spoken about the fully expansion nozzles. There are pressures and you can see how you can double your cleaning energy. We can use different sizes to get deeper reaches into the tube banks, as well as increase the cleaning energy. And through the control system, we can dynamically change the sequence to follow where the fouling is and clean the power as we go along, which you cannot do on a static system where you have to go and adjust the steam pressure at each and every soup lower. So here's uh, an example of what we achieved at a plant, another plant in Brazil. It's a 3,000 ton unit running six soup blows at a time. They were running 15 months, but the, every three months they had to chill and blow, basically thermally shock. And twice uh, uh, through that campaign, they had to water wash. So the challenge was to run for 15 months, chill and blow once, water wash only once. And through a, the implementation of this control system and the larger nozzles for more reach and cleaning power, we were able to eliminate the chill and blows and the water wash and run it for six, 15 months. So you can see then by a combination of the nozzles and a cleaning strategy that you can either save steam or you can try to extend your runtime. Now let's move on to the third strategy here, which is more towards the steam savings, which, and it's called we call it the high power, low pressure soot blower. So there is there are two fundamental questions that we need to ask: Do we really need high enthalpy steam for soot blowing, and do we need to waste our energy using pressure regulating valves when it comes to soot blowing? So on the left here is a conventional system. You can see the boiler produces about 103 bar of steam and a PRV or pressure regulating valve is added to knock down this pressure to send it back to the soot blowers. In some older boilers, they might go straight from the boiler to the soot blower. The balanced steam is sent to a turbine, goes through two extractions, generates power you get these, the low pressure and the medium pressure. So the proposition here is rather than wasting energy by adding a PRV through which you throttle or just sending high pressure steam straight to the soup blower, can we not use these extraction points and use a lower pressure steam to do the same job and keep, uh, keep the boiler clean? Let's look at an example here. In this boiler, it produced a steam at 50 kilopounds an hour that went to the soot blowers and the remaining went to a turbine through two extractions to generate 21 megawatts of power. So the idea then is can we eliminate the soot blowing steam from the boiler send it to the turbine, you add the 50 here, and bring it over to the first extraction point, which is around 200 PSI, and use that extra steam to generate more power. In this instance, you'll get about one, around two megawatts more, to bring you up to about 22 megawatts of power. So if we were to take this at $50 a megawatt hour, there could be an incremental earnings of around $850,000 per year for this system. Naturally, if you have higher pressure boilers, you can do more. So in order to do this, you're working with this lower pressure steam. So you need 
to minimize all your pressure drops. For this purpose, back in the uh, middle 2000s, I ended up designing a soot blowing soot blower which has a bigger valve, which is one of the places where you lose a lot of pressure in a soot blower, and a larger feed tube, which is the second place where you lose a lot of pressure in a soot blower before it is delivered to the nozzle. In order to accommodate this bigger feed tube, the lance tube needs to be bigger, so it's going up to four inches from the traditional three and a half that you see, and the nozzle size has to be increased to account for the lower pressure. So at, as a minimum, we are looking at an inch and a quarter nozzle to be able to give you the same cleaning efficiency as the high pressure system. But in this case, you are generating more power. Here's a list of places where we've implemented this system. It goes back to 2007. That's where the original design was done. It was a new recovery boiler. A sister unit was built later and it had the same system on. And you can see that there have been cases where we've also retrofitted uh, existing boilers. There are three of them in this list uh, to be able to do this. This is one system here in India a comp had actually both. It had the smart clean system as well as this low pressure soup blowing system. The one down here is operating almost at, a, at 10 bar pressure or 150 PSI soup blowing. So when it comes to uh, the last piece of this uh, it was the economic sustainability. So all of these efficiency improvements that we were talking about in terms of uh, cleaning and so on can be lost very quickly if your mechanical equipment does not work properly. So the soup blowers need to be working so that they can do what they're supposed to do and when they're supposed to do it. So. What we are seeing today is with uh, the reductions in workforce, there's a lot of uh, uh, reduction in the ability for people to maintain these soup blowers. On one side, if we have preventive maintenance where you do a lot of maintenance to keep the failures low, there are high costs. And if you wait to the end till everything falls apart, there are also high costs with a lot of failures. And if a boiler goes down for whatever reason uh, due to a soot blower uh, failure, then that could be even worse. So when you put all of these pieces together, there is a point at which you can be the most cost effective in terms of sustaining this entire system. And this is what this fitness to operate program is about, where we implement instrumentation into the soot blower as well as through a monitoring process, monitor the, uh, and make sure that the soup blowers are working in good condition and being able to do what they're supposed to do to give you the realizations that we spoke about before, because at the end of the day, you can lose over a million dollars a day by the boiler going down. So having said this, let me summarize, we can double the peak impact pressure with fully expanded nozzles. We can use feedback controls to save energy as much as 3% or reduce, bring it down to 3% of the MCR. We can also combine them with larger nozzles to eliminate or uh, increase your runtime. By using the uh, high performance, low pressure soup blower, we are able to generate power possibly somewhere in the neighborhood of one to four megawatts. And with the uh, FTO or the fitness to operate program, we can achieve uh, sustainable uh, operations in order to defend all of these benefits above. So having said that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. If you had any questions, you are more than welcome. And my information is here and it will be available if you need to reach me later. Thank you. 
Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Jamil. It looks like we do have one question here uh, that's come in so far. Uh, high levels of chloride in the craft recovery cycle of pulp mills can cause plugging in the recovery boiler. Uh, can this technology eliminate the need of a CI removal system? It's, it could certainly, uh, the, the, the presence of chlorides definitely is one of those bad actors when it comes to the operations and the deposition side in that ash fouling that I was talking about. There, is a, there, is a sec, uh, there was a section there or a box there that I had uh, called chemistry, which is really the chlorides. What you can do is with this system, not to eliminate it, but you can certainly help in improving the cleaning while possibly uh, minimizing the need or reducing the need for this and maybe in certain instances, if you can tolerate it, you could possibly even avoid having to implement something. I know of some plants back in the 90s where they changed the membrane grade cost to a membrane grade caustic, got rid of the chlorides, added the soot blower nozzles and uh, were able to save steam and uh, keep the boiler running. Uh, and uh, that I think I spoke about that somewhere back in the middle, uh, late 90s, uh, about that uh, project where, where this was done. So it's, it is possible uh, to somehow uh, impact it depending on how bad your chlorides are. Okay, um, so we got another question here. Uh, normally, how, uh, how, much, how, how much, how many kilowatts of electricity can be generated by a ton of steam at 60 bars of pressure? I'll have to, uh, if I knew the, uh, the, 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 you need the enthalpy going in and the extraction points coming out through which we can uh, just look at, uh, if, you do, if you do a simple thermodynamic calculation, you can generate uh, the amount of uh, power. I don't have that right at, the, at my fingertips, but I'd be more than happy to uh, help someone if I knew the conditions, the pressure and the temperature of the steam is needed to get define the enthalpy coming into the turbine and then uh, the extraction point at which uh, uh, one can uh, uh, take the steam out. Okay. Um, and then we have another question here. Uh, you must have detectors for your smart clean. Are they cameras? No, we are not using uh, cameras. We are using the uh, boiler data that is already available. Uh, basically the temperature pressures of the steam going in and out of heat, heat exchanger, flue gas temperatures, and uh, the draft losses which are already being measured. So these are signals that are already there. Uh, if they're not there, they can easily be added by adding thermocouples and uh, pressure taps. And uh, we do not use at the moment any imaging uh, technology. Uh, to do this. Okay. Uh, follow up to that question is, do you sit blow one way or both ways? Uh, that cleaning, uh, the cleaning power that I was talking about, it is implemented when necessary to do both ways. If we think that we could reduce it by doing it in one way, certain soot blowers could be uh, operating in a one way direction and while the others operate in a two-way direction. And if one needs more cleaning as time goes by, then you could be even switching from one way to two way, almost like on the fly. If you find that the last operation didn't work very well and you didn't get your target, you could already automatically set the set point uh, for the next time around and, uh, and also switch it from one way to two way. So it's a constant, uh, a dynamic operation that's taking place 24-7. Okay, a uh, couple more questions here as well. Um, how does the smart gauge help with detection and cleaning? It uh, basically is uh, weighing the amount of ash that is, uh, that is uh, building up or accumulating on your pendants. So you have, uh, when the boiler is clean, you zero out the gauges, and as time goes by, 
you'll see the weight accumulating. If you run a soot blower and it knocks it down, the weight will drop again, like I was showing on that graph, which is the opposite of, uh, of the uh, cleanliness coming through the heat absorption or the heat transfer method. Um, next question. Uh, have there been issues with companies with security, uh, security issues dealing with the cloud when implementing a project? Actually, uh, now we are sort of moving uh, in that direction where because of these, uh, uh, you're really pushing things out and you're not uh, having anyone coming through and it's through your through the OSI Pi system uh, where uh, one is able to, I'm sure there has to be obviously some type of firewalls and so on that the, uh, that the uh, plant uh, would have to take care of. And uh, so far, uh, we have not uh, had any issues. In fact, it has been a better way than what we used to do, where we used to dial in to gather data through VPN connections. Um, next question is, uh, can we retrofit the existing SIP blowers to high power, low pressure, to a high power, low pressure SIP blower? They can be done. Uh, like that one in India was done. Uh, when you start going to low pressure uh, soot blowers, you know, some things to consider. Uh, the, the, the opening on the wall has to, be, uh, has to accommodate the larger lance tube. That will be one. The uh, pressure now is lower. So the steam supply side, the piping that brings the steam has to be uh, uh, maybe increased to account for the pressure drops between the, the source point and the soot blower. So it takes, uh, it takes uh, a bigger pipe, a supply pipe, to be able to do it. But the soot blower itself, you have to, you have to change the, uh, the feed tube, the popper valve, and the, the lance tube, if they happen to be uh, uh, using the smaller lance tube. Awesome. Right. Not seeing any more questions come in. Um, so I know we did get a couple of messages throughout. Uh, just as a reminder, we will be sending a copy of the slides uh, to all the attendees and the recording will be available on uh, tappy.org. Uh, the web address for that is uh, www.tappy.org backslash education backslash webinars. Um, that's where the webinar recording will be housed. Um, and did you have uh, anything anything else for us, Dr. Jamil? No, if anyone wanted, uh, uh, in terms of those earlier papers and things that I was talking about, they are, they, there are Tappy uh, conferences and there are Tappy journal publications. And more recently, in terms of uh, the uh, maintenance, uh, I have uh, it's sort of still under review. There is a TAPI tip that I have written, and it's uh, soon as the uh, Steam and Power Committee for TAPI approves it, then that will be published as well and should be available for people in the mills uh, to use. Sure thing. Uh, just to answer the last question we had about the slides, the slides will be uh, sent in a follow-up email to all attendees. So you'll get the PDF of those uh, along with the post-webinar survey. So, um, well, thank you again, Dr. Jamil, for an excellent webinar. And thank you again to our sponsors, Clyde Industries. Um, if you have any further questions, please uh, don't feel, don't hesitate to reach out to Dr. Jamil's contact and Thank you again to everyone for attending today's webinar. This concludes the webinar for today. Thank you. Stay healthy. <laughs>